I'm just going to keep on doing this until there's more people on. I heard that when you go live, sometimes they cut like the first few minutes off the beginning of the video. So that's why I was recommended by someone. Hey, Will, how's it going to have um, like a, I don't know, like a, some music playing and just like a screenshot and then say starting live in five minutes to avoid that. But I thought I thought I would just kind of do this instead. For those of you wondering what camera this is, this is a very unique SLR. I film SLR, which is the, well, you can read it right there. It's a Minolta 110 zoom, and it does actually come with a zoom lens here. Uh, this is the focusing, actually. So this is the zoom part right here. It's, uh, I think, 35 to, what does it say, 67 or something like that. But that's in 110 format. So it's like a 50 to 135. And it's a full manual focus, manual zoom. It's a par focal zoom lens. It's not a uh, varia focal. So it's, you can zoom in, focus, and then zoom back out. And uh, someone just gave this to me recently. And now Camera Girl wants it. And so I thought I would uh, feature this camera um i didn't announce this and so i didn't really expect more than what i have four six people on now um i know i'm supposed to announce these things i don't think i've ever tried this time before but it is around eight or nine o'clock in the morning in asia saturday morning and people are just getting off of work here in north america so if i waited two hours i think i would have had more people on and if I did it much earlier in the morning, I probably would have had more people on. So this is kind of an odd uh, 8 a.m. in Manila. Thank you for joining from Manila. And let me know if the audio sounds okay. I don't even know if it's I can even change the audio anymore. Um, let me just hear live chat. Enable live chat. Yeah, everything's enabled. But I don't think I can change the actual audio settings now that I set it up. I wish audio was good. Oh, excellent. Okay. I'm using um, uh, a shotgun microphone here, but when I plug it into the computer, it doesn't tell me the name of the shotgun microphone because it's an analog input instead of a digital input. So it just says real tech audio. So, but I'm glad that it sounds good. Hey, Merlin, how's it going, buddy? How are you feeling? Are you feeling good? I hope you're, you're, you're well. We were texting and then all of a sudden... You stopped texting and I was somewhat worried, but you're a strong guy. You're you're strong and alive. Uh, thanks for joining. Audio is good. Um, 1 a.m. in Norway. I apologize, uh, trailer 2255, that it is 1 a.m. in Norway, unless this is a, a good time for you. Um, you could sort of tell I have a, a, I have a little LED light controller uh, for my studio and you could tell the you can tell the color theme is green. And the reason for that is, of course, we all heard, right? The discontinuation of Fujifilm, the Pro 400H. And luckily for me, um, you know, I'm nerdy. I, I keep bricks. This actually has an expiry date of 2015. So this is already five years old. So this is, ah, this is vintage. This is vintage stock here, and I think this will go up in value, although I don't really care about value. I really don't care if this is worth 50 bucks or 50,000 bucks. Well, maybe if it's worth 50,000 bucks, I'd care. But, you know, I just like collecting things. I'm a collector, right? And like most collectors, you're not doing it for the money. At least I think you shouldn't. You should be doing it because you love things. And so um, I, luckily I kept this intact. I have another brick probably, but just the the way I store sometimes the the saran wrap kind of breaks open. So I do have another probably a full brick uh, with the matching batch number, and then I probably have another two bricks that are newer than this that there aren't they aren't shrink wrap. But this is my only shrink wrap box there. So I thought I would leave it there in homage to maybe discontinued Fujifilm products like this here the. The X70, this is discontinuous. Maybe I'll, I'll put it back here along with, with the, uh, the Pro 400H, although it's not discontinued officially yet. I mean, it is officially discontinued, but 
you can still get new, right? I mean, there's still stores that have it new in stock, so you can still go and buy it new. Scotland! Hey, Fred from Scotland, how's it going? Man, I would love to visit, visit Scotland, Wales, just all over the UK and Britain. Like, just, I would love to. And I don't even drink scotch. But a friend of mine last year went to Scotland and he was trying all the different, I don't know, you call them distilleries. And, and other than the scotch, which I don't mind sipping a little bit, I'm not a consumer of alcohol very much. Camera Girl loves her whiskey and loves her scotch and her bourbon and all that stuff. Camera Girl could, could hold down her alcohol really well. I can't. I get sleepy. But the, the pictures that he took of the area, beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. These low kind of brick fences, I guess, to keep sheep in. It doesn't look like it's tall enough to keep anything in or out, except maybe for livestock. Um, but just rolling hills and stuff. I would love to go visit there. Um, watching from New York. Yeah, New York is not a bad time for you guys, right? It's like 7 o'clock. Well, the reason why I'm starting a bit early is because camera gets off. Of, camera girl, my wife, gets off at 5. And so I, I, have, I have 50 minutes now to talk before I got to get going. So there's 20 of you on now. So thank you so much for joining. I gave a quick notice on, on Instagram slash Facebook. So it tells people I'm on. Uh, but other than that, I should have probably given 24 hours notice. I had a meeting, a conference call this morning, as well as a, a meetup sort of outdoors for an upcoming street photography show, Vancouver street photography, check out their Instagram account. They have a show kind of right near my house. It's an, outside the McGill library. So if you are in the Vancouver area, go check that out. But um, other than that, I, I kind of had a busy day. And then I looked at the time, I'm like, oh man, it's almost, it's almost time to go live. So that's why I quickly set this up. And Dekushino Tabi, good morning. I had a feeling this would be a good time for you. For all of my Japanese and Hong Kong and all through South Asia, Thailand, Philippines. Uh, I know this is a good time for you guys. Maybe in two hours, it'd be even better. But again, I, I got to go home to Camera Girl. I think she gets off at 5.30, actually. So I have a little bit of time, but I don't like keeping these. I don't like having these longer than an hour because my voice, I start to lose my voice. And also, is this too dark? I can brighten it up. I have um, a Falcon Eyes, um, those little panel lights, LED panel lights, but they sent me a remote control so I can brighten this up a bit. But then if it's too bright, then you can't see the green. And that's the point. It's an homage or homage to the, let's, let's do it again. Pro 400H, it's been officially discontinued. I'm thinking of reaching out to Fujifilm Canada and saying, hey, can you guys send me a brick of this and I can do like a, a farewell kind of a, show or something like that a farewell i should bring this back here a farewell show a farewell something right something to and and it'll be kind of funny if they you know like if i can get a, a pro 400 h and 110 and then use it with this but i know that lamography is the only company now that are creating fresh batches of 110 films so i thought this would be a lot of fun to to play with uh to order some 110 film i think maybe I can get some locally here at Bow Photo. Uh, for those of you that know, let me know. But I, th I think I can get some at Bow Photo here. And I have just a plethora of little cameras here. I have my Nikon 35 Ti, which is a, a beautiful, beautiful camera. I prefer the flash on the 35 and 28 Ti with the 3D matrix metering, more so than my Ricoh GR1, which is a great street shooter, but Flash balance is just okay, but this one here is like my prettiest camera of all time is the 35 Ti. I really think, like the 28 Ti is more my style, but it's black on black. This is uh, just raw titanium on with black highlights. And so very pretty camera. I love this thing. And it kind of is reminiscent of cameras like the new Fujifilm X100V, right? People just are drawn to this camera immediately when they see it. I've mentioned this before where I have this kind of around my neck and sometimes even off to my side. And I go to a place like Starbucks or wherever and you see someone that you know would 
typically never engage in a conversation with you. And even as you come up to them, you could tell they're not much of an engaging type cashier or server. But as soon as they see their, the, the X100, their eyes light up and they immediately strike up a conversation. One time this, there's this girl at Starbucks, the barista, was so excited about seeing the X100 that there was a lineup behind me and she was still talking. And I kind of said to her, well, I'll be sitting over there. And I said, I'm waiting for my wife. She's just at an appointment. So I'll be there for an hour. Um, maybe when the lineup's gone, you can come and talk to me on your break. And, and she did. And she just was talking about how she wanted to buy this camera. So anyways, aesthetics of a camera, I, I feel they're very important. The GR3, which I've been doing a lot of pictures with recently, I love this camera, but it's stealthy, right? Like no one's going to come up to you when they see you carrying this. They probably think you're carrying some film point and shoot from the 1990s, but uh, stealthy camera and it works really well. So I, I like the GR3, I like the X100V, I like the 35Ti, I like the X70, very cool camera. I wish they made an X80, but I have a feeling that they are done with this series of cameras, which would be, which I hope I'm wrong, but I don't know if this articulating screen is dead, but we'll 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 see what happens, right? Because I think um, they kind of had a good thing with this, really kind of a low angle. Also, if you are doing kind of top down type either video or photography work, uh, this this screen is pretty darn cool. So let me just try to catch up to comments here. Sorry, I kind of went off on a tangent. Let me see here, Fuji Graveyard, yeah, you know. I mean, I have a whole box in there of expired film and just kind of reminiscing through not just Fuji film, but Kodak, Konica film, Agfa film. I think I have a full brick of the, the Agfa Vista 200, which everyone says is basically superior 200. It might be from the same similar batch, but it definitely looks a little different to me. And I've talked to some friends that worked at labs. It's funny. Some say it's exactly the same. Others say, no, it's not the same. So I don't know, but I've always liked the egg for this, the 200 as a cheap uh, 200 ISO film that I put in my point and shoots. And that is also discontinued. Let me see here. Bourbon is terrible. Yeah. I don't drink alcohol steel, Matthew. So I don't know. Like to me, all alcohol sort of tastes terrible. I can handle kind of like the hard liquor because you're not really drinking. Like I think beer is the grossest. It's like pop that isn't sweet. And this is coming from a non-alcohol drinker, non-beer drinker. Um, I just don't like the taste of beer. I like wine to settle my stomach on flights. I always tell people like when I fly and I eat the meals on the plane, sometimes I just fast and I just don't eat on the plane. But other times when I do eat, I feel like I need a little bit of wine. And I, I do like red wine, sort of dry room temperature. I don't like white wine. I used to like it, but it's too cold on a plane. And then all the hard liquors, like scotch and stuff, I don't mind just taking a quick sip just for the flavor. I like the oaky kind of woody type flavor of that type of stuff. Uh, let me just see here. I noticed the green homage. Yeah, I thought I would just do a little bit of a green there. And... Merlin, you have the same 110 camera. You think Nicole has some? Oh, very good. Yeah, I'll talk to I'll talk to Nicole and see if she does. Yeah, I mean, this was a weird camera. Like it's super overbuilt. The quality is really nice. It has features that a lot of entry level SLRs don't even have, film SLRs. And yet the format is so tiny. Like one thing I actually really like is look at this spinning. Look at this spinning lug. It's the little, the, the tiny lugs, but look at it, it spins, which is, which you might think, well, what's so great about the spin? I'll, I'll let you, I'll, I'll show you what the, oh, look at that. Put my hat back on. See this, when this spins, it, it, if it didn't spin, it would be like this, right? But it would kind of want to go down. But because of the, because of the spins here, it actually points the camera downwards, which I think is awesome for uh, something like this. And it has like um, a shutter, a proper shutter blind. So if you don't want, if you're doing bulb mode, you don't want light leaking from the back, you can actually put the blind there. The little dot is to remind you that you've closed off the back there. There's a diopter here. It has a little macro mode. So if you are um, 
put the little macro lens inside the lens element. So then you can do macro photography and uh, full manual focus, full proper parfocal zoom. Like as I was saying, you can zoom in, focus, and then zoom back out and it's in focus. Where a lot of zoom lenses, like all of the Fujifilm X series lenses, because it's all electronically controlled, are all very focal. So you can zoom in, focus manually, which is focused by wire. And if you zoom back again, it's out of focus, right? And the 60 and the 80 is really, I don't want to call it bad, but like if you zoom in to 80, focus and zoom back out, the image is complete. I think the camera tries to um, sort of like electronically compensate, but it's not very good. So when you zoom in, when you're doing video with that lens, people are like, oh, it goes out of focus. Well, it's because it's a, it's a very focal zoom lens it's not a par focal so it's and then i got this um merlin i'm not sure if you actually got the 40.5 mil rubberized lens hood on here and it's funny it's 40.5 which is the same as my which is the same as the leica cle 40 mil f uh two lens it's the same so you can share filters across and it's funny because this came out in 1979 1980 and the CLE came out at the same time. So I wonder if there's some kind of a connection between this uh, Zoom 110 and the Minolta CLE. But this is an, this is an overbuilt camera for what it is. Which, and also it has a really cool uh, shutter cock at the bottom left corner here. Which is weird. But I mean, you know, I think the Roly 35s were like that too. It was in a weird spot. So it's a really cool camera. I think it's cool. Can't wait to put some rolls through it. Okay, I'm gonna try to catch up here. I'm always playing catch up. I apologize. Uh, Lee W from UK. Hello, Lee W. Um, yeah, it is sad only to be able to use 400 H digitally, right? But I think Fujifilm were kind of transparent where they told us, like, look, there's a layer of the fourth layer, I think, of that film that they just said they can't, they're, they're struggling to get the, the, the actual materials to make it. And so instead of changing the formula, which I don't see a problem because the Acros 2 is also a changed formula, right? It's not the same as the original Acros. So I say sort of, okay, I, I, I thank you for letting me know and let us know that uh, you can't make it because of that fourth layer chemical that you can't access, but you could just make a new emulsion, right? But I think there's a lot of investment and and engineering and, and stuff like that. And they're just like, you know what? Let's just make COVID vaccines and let's just make makeup and whatever else. The, they have a pharmaceutical division, right? They have a chemistry division. They have a cosmetics division. And so they know chemistry very well. They still make paper and chemistry. They still make film like Instax, right? It's a, it's a physical product that needs chemicals for it to work. And so, um, you know, they got, they have scientists and engineers and chemists that are at Fujifilm, but they just decided that they're going to discontinue foreign and age, which is very sad. Um, let's just try to catch up here. And Merlin, you have the same one with the built-in hood. That's awesome. Uh, Fujifilm's moving on to bigger things. Yeah, I think Fujifilm's moving on to things that will, that's more sustainable as a business, I think. Um, but it is sad. And yeah, Fujifilm, they, they purposely killed FP100 or just the peel apart film, right? They killed the 3200, which was based on the Fujifilm 667, which I think even that was based on an older 665, which I have, I think I have a box of it somewhere still. And uh, the Impossible Project, which is now now back to being called Polaroid because they bought out the name Polaroid, which was owned by, I think, some Chinese conglomerate that was just putting Polaroid on T-shirts and flashlights and power banks, right? They weren't really doing anything with Polaroid, Polaroid. So the Impossible Project bought the name back. So now Polaroid is back to being Polaroid, but not the original Polaroid, but the Impossible Project Polaroid. And they approached Fujifilm to buy the, the, the machinery that makes FP100C. That they're like, we will buy it off of you or we will just take it off of your hands. Can we please just, can we negotiate? And Fujifilm would have none of it. They wouldn't even 
I don't even think they even allowed to take a meeting with them. They're just like, no. And they basically dismantle and destroyed the equipment and just recycled all the metal. And I just thought that was kind of like, you know, we're not hearing Fujifilm side of the story. There may have been a bigger issue of why they physically destroyed all the equipment. But if it's a matter of copyright or patent, it makes no sense because you're destroying it anyway. So why do you care? And they could have put a clause in the contract saying, you know, if they allowed the Impossible Project to take the FP100C machinery, that they put a clause saying, we still own the equipment, but we are just leasing it to you for $1 a year for the next five years. And at the end of the five years, if we decide that we want it back, then we will take it back for $5 or something. They could have negotiated something so that they could still kind of have their hands on the product. Meaning if all of a sudden peel apart film went through the roof, Fujifilm's like, hey, we want the machine back. And the impossible probably would have said, you know, we had a good five year run. Um, they were going to destroy it anyways. So we're glad we have the five year run. And maybe Fujifilm will sell us some of the film and let us relabel it the impossible project to relabel it Polaroid or something. Right. But no, they just wouldn't have anything to do with it. They just wanted it all destroyed. So um, that's the one thing that really kind of has uh, scratched my head and my sideburns about why Fujifilm did that. Um, Merlin, there you go. So Polaroid was an IP company in California, oh, was in California. And impossible license Polaroid to become Polaroid Originals, but the latest name change was a merger. Very good. Yeah, FP100 is great. I mean, I have the I have the original, not the original, but the final version of the uh, X, uh, the FP100C in Polaroid, which was the Polaroid. Um, what was it now? Six. Six six. What was the number? I have a whole case of it in my closet. It take me a few minutes to take it out, so I'm not gonna show you. But I have uh, about maybe twelve boxes, half a half a case of of the last Polaroid batch. I think it was six six five actually. Polaroid six six five. I have six six nine. Is it? I don't think it's six six nine. I think I, I'll, I'll be back. I think I have some six six. I have six six seven. I have six, six, four. So, so this is my second last box of six, six, seven, which is the ISO 3000. It's not in really good condition, but you know, I apologize. It's from 1980 something. I don't even know what the expiry on this is. Uh, whatever the expiry. Expiry is, oh, it's not too bad. It was 0504 meaning like 2004. So this is probably the last batch of 667. And then this is the, it was replaced with 664 ISO 100 black and white. And this one here was 2004-09. So this is pretty darn good. And then I bought the last batch of color 100 uh, Polaroid. I bought a whole master case, like a box of 25. And I've used up, just over half of it and I have the other half stashed away here let's just put this here um, with uh, the other discontinued films and then now in, in honor of Polaroid let's let's switch over to blue there you go now it's blue let's uh, shoot it soon unless you're keeping it in the fridge yeah this is the basement studio suite and the I have it on the floor, and the floor it's it's cool down there. It's probably about ten degrees throughout the year over there, and so um, yeah. I mean, I don't know. It wasn't always in. A, I, it wasn't always fridge kept. I do have some egg for pan, uh, the APX twenty five. I have uh, half a case of that in my fridge over there. Did anyone know if the Pro 160 NS is discontinued as well? Um, yeah, I think I think it is discontinued. I have some of that in 120 still. I think I have two packs of 120. Um, yeah, I think that's discontinued. Definitely discontinued. And Merlin, yeah, I recently shot with it uh, maybe two years ago and the first two shots, the chemistry was dry. 
And then the other eight shots were fine. Like the, the chemistry was fine. It spread really nice. I think maybe even because when I did it, it was cold. I should have maybe made sure it warmed up a little bit. I made sure my rollers were clean and everything. So we'll see. I might, uh, I might use it sometime soon. But let me see here. It is, I'm 25 minutes in. Um, what else did I want to talk about? I want to talk about the FP100C. I wanted to talk about uh, this really weird one, 110 SLR camera, which is really neat. As soon as Camera Girl saw it, she's like, I want it. I want to give it to me. I'll, I'll trade back the XD11 that I stole from you. And I'll give that back to you. And then I'll take, I'll take this. And I'm like, well, first of all, even what you stole from me was always mine. And so I, I, I don't know what she means by hers and mine, because I mean, it does it really matter if it's hers or mine. I mean, it's, it's we're, we're married. Right. So anyways, yeah, she really thought this was super cute. So I got to get some film for it. And then you've guys been watching me with my X 100 V and GR three. I did a, a YouTube video and, tons of comments tons of people chiming in saying i own both or or i had both i got rid of this one or i got rid of this one or i kept both or i got rid of both but it was a really i think it's hit almost ten thousand views so a lot of people and these are older cameras this is about a year old uh, gr3 is over two years old but still a lot of people chiming in on what they think about these two cameras which kind of shows there's probably pent up demand for all-in-one digital point shoots with reasonably reasonable size sensors, like an APS-C size sensor. And so let's hope for the best for an X80 or a new, uh, like a, Q well, there's already a Q2 and a Q monochrome, but maybe they'll make uh, a APS-C size type Q, which I think would actually be kind of cool. And then uh, who, whatever else, whatever else, if would you, I mean, you know, the X80, right? Hopefully they'll come up with an X80. And that's for those of you who are wondering like what, what hood do I have on the X100 V is those of you that might not know the X70 and the X100 shared the same front filter thread. And so I took the hood from the X70 and put it on all my X100s, including my X100 F it fits and it doesn't vignette in the corners when you take photos. Well, it shouldn't because this is a wider lens. And so the X100 has a um, narrower field of view. And so def definitely you can put it on the X100 and not get any vignetting in the corners. See if I've missed any comments here. Um, let me see here. Happy wife, happy life, my friend. That is true. I got to make sure. And GR4, yes, yeah, funny. I'm beginning a lot of questions about the GR4. And I always tell people about anything that's kind of what's coming up. I don't always have an opportunity to get NDA, so non-disclosure agreement, uh, pre-production, pre-embargo products. But when I do, I can't talk about it, right? And not every time that I don't talk about it means I have it, but it sometimes it means I get, sometimes like manufacturers will send us forms to fill out and say, hey, like if we created the next, let's just say something I pretty much know doesn't exist. The next X80, what features do you want to see? And I filled out these questionnaires from various manufacturers and kind of give my two bits of what I think should come up. And so um, I'm not, even though I'm not restricted to talk about it, I'd rather not in case they're watching and they think, oh, Take talks too much, which I do. But I don't want to talk about stuff. But the X, uh, the GR4 coming out this year would be nice, but the, 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 the time it took from the GR2 to come up with the GR3 was a very long time. What was it like five years or four years? It's way too long. And so I would hope that they would replace the GR3 with the GR4 and add a built-in flash, go a little bit wider if they can, and sure, they can't put an EVF because there's absolutely no room for an EVF, but at least allow for an external EVF to be put on here for those that want uh, to be able to see through a viewfinder. And then improve the autofocus. Lens is great. IBIS is great. If they can fit in a bigger battery as well, if they're going to go a little bit wider to add a flash, might as well also add a bigger battery. But um, those are the things I would want for in a GR4. I don't think there's a lot 
that they can do, especially like people are talking about the lens design on the GR series. Uh, this is a, a, a like a barrel design lens, meaning when the lens autofocuses, the distance between the lens elements don't shift, where something like an X100, it does shift. So that's the way when you turn it on or off, the lens doesn't really come out and in where the, the GR series have always collapsed. And that sort of that barrel sort of design, when it focuses, all the elements move together. And that's why macro is really good on the GR series. That's why it's sharp throughout all um, focus range because the lens is equally sharp because the elements don't shift at all. And that's really comes back to even the old film point and shoot design. It's kind of this, the, all the elements shift together, right? Like that. All the elements shift together, which keeps it really sharp. But the problem is it creates this vacuum as the lens goes in and out. And with that vacuum, it sucks in dust. And that's where the GR has always had dust issues being sucked into the, the chamber between the, the lens elements and the sensor. And unless they completely redesign this, meaning even when it's turned off, the lens would stick out this far. So it's possible for them to make a lens that has internal focusing, but it would probably always stay out like that. And the only way they can make it completely like that is because they have that, that collapsible lens design where the elements don't shift in between while focusing. And so um, that would be a huge endeavor. Every GR has had this design going all the way back to the film days. And I think that's uh, the only way they can do that is maybe by weather sealing this sort of chamber here and help, and I think they have been doing a better job at sealing. I haven't heard much complaints about the GR3 with dust. I know the original GR uh, APS-C, people complained about dust, and the GR2. I've never had problems with my GR uh, for whatever reason, but I know a lot of people did, and so uh, that's my take on a GR4 if it comes out. Um, though product reviews may be important for business, I sadly miss your stuff like challenges with John Lehman or all your interviews with interesting and special people. Gear is one thing, but no, 100% for sure. I, I prefer that type of video versus like talking head. But first of all, for this year, I can't meet with people. And so I am working on doing interviews via YouTube live or if not live, at least we record it live and then I do post edit work. And I do have an upcoming video where I will be on the street and my videographer will come with me. We'll both be masked up. Um, other than some of the B-roll scenes he'll shoot with me, I'll maybe take off my mask. And of course I'm not traveling anymore. So that part of it is gone. And so, uh, and also those things take more time to create. We're like, look at this talking head thing. The, the, I spend more time on the thumbnail and description than I do with the actual editing of these videos. I just basically post this video up. So I think that um, I need someone that's more full-time. Because at the time when I was doing a lot of stuff with John Lehman, I had a full-time videographer and editor working with me for about, I think, eight months. And we would shoot, he would, sh he would shoot the video and do all the editing. I would look over the edit and then fix some things up and then I would do the thumbnail and the description. And so we can pump out two of those type of videos per week. But now that I'm by myself and I need to work with other videographers who are also busy, um, you know, those kind of videos are like once or twice a year now, and especially with the pandemic. So I do hope to be able to do more of that uh, in the near future. And especially you know, I need to really grow my my channel because even videographers, you know, they're busy making money and paying the bills and, you know, paying off mortgages and car payments and stuff like that. I want to say, hey, let's shoot a video. You know, their time is worth $1,500 to $2,500 a day and they're doing it with me for free. And so there's only so much I can ask them to do free work for me to the point where I, I feel guilty and or they just say no, like I can't. You can't ask me to do this stuff for free all the time. And so that's another thing that I have to be very conscious of. So, um, yeah. And then if my channel was larger and I had a big enough income, I would actually pay and say, hey, look, I can't pay you 1500 bucks for the day, but, you know, I could pay you 500 bucks if you just come and shoot with me and I can do the rest 
I could do the rest of the editing myself, but I just don't make enough to do that. And so it's kind of a catch-22. Reviews and gear and talking head are quick and easy for me to shoot and post, and they get high enough views where there is some money coming in. And then hopefully that'll help me build up large enough so then, then I can actually pay someone to be my assistant. And so uh, it's this middle ground where a lot of YouTubers will give up, you know, at that 50 to 100,000 range where if you didn't know how to monetize. So as you see, I've taken on sponsors. So KEH is going to be my regular sponsor. And I'm doing that project with Intel, which <laughs> they're not very happy with my performance. I had hoped that me doing a little bit of computer stuff because it makes sense, right? Like I've reviewed sort of like video gear and lighting and stuff. And those videos don't do that well, but you know, these are things that I'm already reviewing and testing. So I thought maybe it would add value for you guys. And if I can get into tech, there's serious money in tech sponsorship. I mean, unlike camera manufacturers, you can just take a look at billboards in places like Singapore and Hong Kong and New York, where an entire side of a building has Samsung or Apple or Intel or, you know, any large consumer electronics company where they have huge marketing budgets to be able to, to sponsor creators like me. But I'm in this weird field of more hardcore uh, photographers, not so much videographers and film photographers, which is kind of a niche market. And to be able to pick up a sponsor like Intel is kind of a big deal. And, uh, but I don't think they're gonna renew with me, I think. But if I had a sponsor like that every month, I can definitely afford to pay someone a thousand bucks to help me. But I don't think they're gonna, my guess is they're not gonna wanna work with me. And so it's back to like more, like I wouldn't say that Intel was off brand because hey, like I'm using a laptop, I'm using the Asus ROG Zephyrus Dual 15 laptop right now to do this video. And it works a lot better actually than using my MacBook. I have the new M1 as you guys saw my video. And it's that that um, the hardware, some hardware doesn't work really well. My, my um, capture, video capture card doesn't work very well on my M1. And also this laptop has an analog microphone input in, which is great. I don't have to go through uh, 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 any kind of a dock or a hub and then have a, a DAC right, or reverse DAC, I guess. It takes the, an analog signal and it converts it to a digital. I don't need that. This is an actual analog input for microphone stuff. So I actually really like using this, but if my followers won't accept me doing tech sponsors, right? So meaning Asus or Intel or Apple or, or you know, NVIDIA or, or any of those tech companies with deep, deep pockets, if you guys don't take it, then I can't really do it. I'll tell these sponsors, look, I do a camera review. It gets 10,000 views or 50,000 views. I do a laptop review or unveiling and I get 200 views. And then the next video, I do a, a camera review and it's back up to 10,000. I'll tell them like, look, like my audience won't take. They just don't see value in someone like me doing tech. And I'd say the money is good, but I, I, I just, my conscience won't allow me to do it because if you guys don't like it, then I'm not going to do it. Right. So, um, anyway, it's kind of a long, long winded explanation of about growing my channel. I would definitely love to grow it, but I either need to do stuff like monetization, um, doing, I don't even know like how people pay for live chats. Like, I don't even know, do I need to activate it? I mean, I'm not looking to like, I do monetize these, like I save them and then I, I put ads on them, AdSense, um, after the video is over. But I know some channels, like, people are constantly paying and stuff like that. But, you know, these are huge channels and stuff. And I know that's why a lot of YouTube channels have gone live because they know, like Twitch or any other kind of a streaming thing where they've allowed for quick monetization, that a lot of YouTubers have gone live now because they know it's like, oh, wow, I can make 500 bucks for a live video plus add AdSense after and have embedded sponsors. So they'll like, wow, we made even, even a small YouTube channel like me could make maybe $2,000 for one live video. And so it gets addictive. They'll do two or three live videos per week. And that helps to cover their bills and pay for a videographer and pay for plane tickets and that kind of stuff. But for me, a lot of the stuff, if you've been following me for many years, you know, like I told camera girl when I started, I'll never, take money out of our family money to do my YouTube. So when I started, I used my iPhone 
5 or 5S and my Ricoh GR as my video camera because that's all I can afford. And all my editing and everything was done on a, iPad, a, a MacBook Air 11-inch. And people are like, oh, that's a crappy laptop. I said, well, that's all I can afford. And I'm still the same. I don't put outside money into this business. So whatever I have, like people are like, hey, take it by like an M10. And I'll be like, well, that's, that's you know half a year's budget for me. I can't do that. I have to use my money wisely. And, and doing these video-centric reviews helped because I didn't have to pay for this light here. I didn't have to pay for the shotgun microphone. I didn't have to pay for this laptop. I didn't have to pay for the monitor I'm using because these companies are sending me these gears to review. And I, I feel that there's value in reviewing them because I do get some of you guys saying, hey, like I'm trying to do my own YouTube setup and I want to see what gear. It's not a big percentage of you guys. It's a small percentage. But you know, these companies do see value in, in sending me these gears to review. And often after the review, not always, but most of the time, they say, just keep it. Like, we don't want that $100 monitor back because you'll be shipping it back to China and we'll be spending, you know, 20 bucks to send it to you, 20 bucks for you to ship it back. We don't want it back. And so we often get to keep these things. And so that also helps me uh, to create content without having this uh, pay stuff out of pocket uh, for all these extra expenses. So I, I didn't mean to go off on a tangent on uh, explaining how my business works. But, you know, in, in the end, it kind of is a business, right? It, we need to at least sustain ourselves. And and to let you know, this is self-sustaining. Like I can, I, I've never paid myself yet. So I've never pulled money out of Big Head Taco. Everything is back into the business. Oh, well, there you go. Jonathan Pham. Thank you very much. 550 Canadian. Uh, so, so that, that is working, right? So I appreciate it. I don't even know how that works. Like, I don't even know where that money ends up in my thing, or if I even get to keep the full 550. Like, I don't know. I don't know how any of this works. Cause you know, I haven't done any, um, what's it called? Patreon. I haven't done Patreon. I haven't done, um, this is my first donation for live. So thank you again, Jonathan. Um, I don't know how any of those, those things work. I just want to like create cool content for you guys. And if you guys don't take some of the things that I do, like I realize, like, oh, wow, this tech video did 200 views. Because like recently I've been getting more and more of these video channels asking to send me more video gear. And, and I, some of them I just had to tell them, no, no, thank you. Like, it's cool you're sending me a $1,000 wireless system. But my last video didn't get much views, and I don't know if there's much value in me doing it for you guys. So thank you, but no thank you. And I get really weird stuff too. Like I had, I think I mentioned this before, and I don't want to mention, oh, Fred, 50 pounds. Uh, how much is that in Canadian? I don't know. I appreciate that. Thank you. I, I didn't even, you guys know this is my number five live show, and I've never asked for anyone to donate, but I appreciate it Fred. Fred, it just says Fred dot dot dot. I don't know if your name is so long, it doesn't come up, but thank you so much. But um, I kind of lost my training of thought here. Um, yeah, I want to make sure that whatever I showcase to you guys, you guys like it. You guys see value in it. And I do find that when I do these lives, I get a lot of questions about film. So that's why I think working with KEH is really cool. I think um, KEH, um, it's funny, they're like, wanting to send me gear and I told them don't worry about it. I think a lot of people work with KEH so they can review free gear. Uh Rich, thank you so much for I'm getting all these all this British pounds. I wish we can get physical money. I don't like virtual money. I like seeing I like seeing physical money, you know, like a British note. It's like wow, there's a queen on it just like Canadian money. But thank you so much Rich, I appreciate it. Um KEH sends gear to guys like us so we can test it, but I told KEH I have so much gear, like film gear, that I can do a video once or twice a month for a year and you don't have to send me anything. And so I know Juan from Beers and Cameras works with KEH. I know um, um, Matt Day works with KEH. And so those guys um, get stuff sent to them. I don't mind them sending me any gear. Let me know if you guys want me to review something weird that I don't have that you see on KEH. In fact, that's a challenge for you guys, for my core audience here. Um, go to KEH, go to buy, and look for some weird camera that they have. When I say weird, I mean, I don't care if it's a 
$10,000 Hasselblad X1D with some crazy lens, or if it's some $50 Hello Kitty film point and shoot, doesn't matter what it is, say, Take, I want you to review this camera. I'll do it. I'll do it just for you guys. And KEH will love it because, you know, they're my sponsor. And so they want me to, in fact, I kind of told them, like, tell me what you have too much of. Stuff that isn't really moving, I'll review it because I find value in every camera. Like, this might not work for you, but it might work really well for somebody else, right? There's, there's cameras that I love. Like, I, I think that this uh, Minolta XD and the XD11 and the XD7, I would take this over most of this era of film point and shoot. This has shutter and aperture priority as well as manual. And inside the viewfinder, you can see, if you're in aperture priority, you can see the shutter speed. If you're in shutter speed priority, you can see aperture. If you're in manual mode, you can see both aperture and shutter speed in the viewfinder. And this came out in the 1970s, right? This is kind of unheard of, the kind of technology. So I love this camera, but this is like a $60 camera on KEH or $100 camera. It's not worth very much. But I love it. So uh, pick something weird that KEH has in stock, and then let me know, and then I will, um, I will, um, I will review it. But enough of you have to ask. If just one of you guys asked for the Hello Kitty. I don't even know if they even have a Hello Kitty point shoot. But if they did, I'll do it. I have all the film. I have labs that are processed the film for me, so it doesn't cost me anything but my time, right? So. Let me know. And hey, Messe. Hey, Masan, Messe, how's it going? Street of Matic. Thank you. Thank you, Messe. I appreciate the, the five, it's like five US dollars, which is like, it's a lot of money. And actually, you know what the funny thing is? The US dollar has been hurting. I get paid in US dollars from all my sponsors and all the articles and all the projects I do. Even when I do like projects that are non folder related, I always just quote things in US dollars because, you know, if someone's, in Japan or in Singapore or in Hong Kong and we're trying to negotiate a price, I don't want them to be telling me in Hong Kong dollars and me saying stuff in Canadian dollars. So internationally, if you do global work, you always quote US dollars. And so, you know, like for the longest time, when I quoted like 400 US, it meant like 650 Canadian, which is like, ah, oh, bonus. But now it's like 400 US is only like 550, 560 US. But it's still worth more. So, anyways, Matze, thank you very much. For those of you who don't know who Street Amatic is, he's an amazing street photographer in. Are you in DC, Matze? Are you in DC? Man alive, what's happening down there? At least before all your photos were in DC. Stay safe. And um, but you know, keep on shooting, right? Do what you can. And uh love to continue seeing your photos. Uh, being produced. So, Massé, thanks for joining. Thank you for the $5. I do appreciate it. And um, let me see here. XH2 is coming out. Um, it is going to be coming out, and this isn't any kind of a rumor mill. We know that at one of the Fuji X summits, um, the president of Fuji Film did say the XH2, the project, the XH series is not discontinued, and they are working on it. And so... Um, there's very little leakage of information. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's actually built in Japan. Any of the stuff made in Japan, leaks are a lot harder to come by versus if it's being made in the Philippines or Thailand or China. I think it's a lot easier because it's, it's a much tighter, smaller team in Japan. And when stuff leaks, it's easier for them to figure out who did it, right? So the, the XH2, I'm sure it's still going to be a premium made in Japan product like the X-Pro series. And uh, yeah, I hope it comes out. I think if the X-H2 comes out, I'm probably going to sell my X-T4 because I don't see a need to have an X-T4. Like right now I'm using the X-T4, but with an external monitor because I don't, the, the front facing monitor doesn't really help me that much. I've gotten used to vlogging without seeing myself. So the X-H2 for studio product shots, for video of me behind the camera, not in front of it. And then I'm actually thinking like an, like the XS10 or something like that for more for vlogging uh, would work out for me. In fact, I even like the X-Pro3 for vlogging because of how the screen flips up so that when your hand is on the back, because I vlog like this with my hand holding it. And if you have a touch screen, you can actually shift the focus point or touch some of the, the, the settings. But with the X-Pro3, there's no worry about that. So I actually do like the X-Pro3 for vlogging. 
Uh, but anyways, thank you, Masay. Thanks for joining. Um, uh, Swav Vision, Shutter Clicks. Shutter Clicks? Did I miss something? That's very, very low. I guess you guys are conversing amongst yourselves, which is great. How about the Fuji GF670? Do they, if they have one in stock, folding, did you actually, oh, you have, okay, cool, KEH. Okay, in fact, I would love to, in fact, I, because I have the, um, I have a lot of 120 film, I think I might even have a 120. Let me just, let me just see if I have any 120 film right here. Uh, no, I don't have, I have 120 film. But it's in the closet, and I kind of don't want to open up. Look at my crazy hair. I need a haircut. But I just wanted to maybe even show you guys, like, you know, like, I need help with albums. Camera Girl was my album girl. Oh, this is, um, these are some of my early shots uh, using the, the six, six, seven of Camera Girl. It's one of my first YouTube videos, guys. If you guys remember me showing you how to load and use the Polaroid Land 250. And so this is, like, these are some of my favorite photos that I've ever taken with uh, 667 and there's another picture there of camera girl I love prints and I haven't even um, I've never even um, scanned these or anything they're just one of I didn't keep the negatives which I should have and then these are just like prints right I always tell people please print your photos oh this is another thing too which is um um, the death of uh, Costco printing. I love Costco printing. It's not like my high-end printing work. Uh, this is a Konica Hexar uh, Kunika. Kunika Hexar AF. This is, uh, I think, Kunika Hexar as well, but it's the... Um, well, I even forgot what film this is. I usually put on the back what film I shot. This might be Japan Camera Hunter. I did a video, I, sh I haven't even posted it, a large format meetup. This may be JCH 400, but uh, I love printing my work and Costco is so cheap, like 25 cents for four by six, a buck 99 for eight by 12. And now that's gone. Now I'm gonna have to go, there's a lot of local labs still like London Drugs that does kind of one hour type printing. But um, yeah, I mean, I love printing my work. They look different when you print. Actually, some photos that look kind of okay um, online, they look okay online, like when you look at it on a computer screen, but as soon as you print the stuff, it just looked like this photo here looked kind of mediocre on a computer screen. But as soon as I printed it, it's like, wow, that actually looks really cool, including photos that are a little bit blurry. Like this is actually blurry. But so on my computer screen, it's like, ah, oh, I've ruined this shot. But then when you print it on a four by six, it's sharp enough. And it's like, oh, this is kind of cool. It could be like a postcard or something like that. And so um, I always tell people, print your work. Oh, this is, I think this is kind of a lost photo. This is just for you guys. This is Mr. David Chan with my buddy, John Ishii. Um, I think this was during the filming of uh, Film is Still Alive. This is one of my behind the scenes shots. With I think I was using the Nikon 28 Ti, but not fill flash. No, actually, this probably was with a 35. Uh, this was probably with a 30 uh, an SLR, the Minolta 9xi with a 35.14. Yeah, that's what I used to shoot this. But uh, anyways, print your work, guys. But uh, if I can put it here, death to Costco printing, another thing that's going to be a thing of the past. And so um, hours up almost it's at 54 minutes thank you so much for joining thank you for all of you guys that uh donated but don't feel obligated to if you you know like spend that money buy a roll of film buy some flowers for your loved ones buy yourself a solid beer an ipa i don't even know what ipa stands for india pale ale something like that is that what it stands for anyways Spend your money any way you like. But for those of you that donated, I do really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And let's just see here. Um, TAC Motors, definitely print. Please print your photos. Um, I, I truly believe that a photograph is not a photograph. Okay? 
it, it, it's, it might be an image on your screen, but a photograph, a proper photograph should be, it should not be virtual. A proper photograph should be something that's in your hand. Now what's on your computer? I mean, it's a photograph, but in its truest sense, I wouldn't call it that. It's a digital image that you are viewing virtually. Like it's a, it's a virtual representation of a photograph, which is a pretty darn good thing and pretty darn convenient. Like I believe in Instagram. I believe in digital photography as much as I believe in, in film photography, but to truly um, enjoy like man alive. I mean, I love this photo. This was, I think, uh, Nikon 28 Ti with Cine Still in Osaka in 2017. This also looked kind of okay when it was um, on screen. It just looked okay. It looked too grainy. I didn't like the, there wasn't enough dynamic range. I just thought like, ah, you know, this is just an okay picture. But as soon as I saw the print, I'm like, man alive. Like this, this photo just really, really speaks to me. And so, um, Trust me, when you print your work, it looks different. And it's not just like, it's not that it's better or worse, it's just different. It's not only different, but it's also better in most cases, I find, especially when you shoot film, because the lenses and the film, it was all meant to be physically printed and not viewed on screen. And so to truly appreciate what Tri-X looks like or HP5, and then you scan it, and then you look at it on your screen or your smartphone, yeah, you can get an essence of that film, but the true way to experience it is to print it and physically look at it. And remember, in terms of the way light works, our screens are RGB. Uh, print, images that are printed are CMYK, right? Which is, which is different than RGB. We don't have time to go over it. But what we are looking at is light hits this and the colors are embedded in this physical medium and we are seeing the reflected light back where a screen is projecting light into us, right? There's not like a light reflecting off of my computer screen and then back to me, but it's reflecting, it's projecting the light into my face. And so even the manner in which we ingest the image, our eyes see it differently. CMYK, physically printed on a physical medium that does not project light, but we need reflected light to look at versus a computer screen that is RGB that is projecting uh, these lit, backlit um, LED uh, lights that are pushing uh, colors towards us, um, I think it's more natural to see it like this. So if you're looking at this photo in the day with a candlelight, under tungsten lighting, all that stuff, it, it, the light kind of mixes, I don't know, it's a, like a full hour conversation, but just the way you consume it is different. And I say it is superior to looking at images um, online. And I'll leave you with one thought of the superiority of a print versus a digital file because of its finiteness, meaning, yeah, you can dupe a print, you can dupe a negative and make multiple versions. But, you know, people will spend $500,000, $100,000 on fine art, right? Like a painting or even a, a, a photograph that's well printed. They'll pay $50,000, 100000 would you pay $100,000 for a digital file? Like someone's like, here is the DNG file, or here's the JPEG made by master photographer so-and-so, even if it's someone like Micah Kenna. I don't think Micah Kenna can sell a JPEG for $10,000. He could sell a print for $10,000 or $50,000 or $100,000. I don't think he can sell a digital negative for $100,000. Because people were like, well, you can make a million of these, and each one is exactly the same. And so why are people willing to pay that much money for a physical print, but not that much money for a digital file, including guys like us? Like if I had a physical print from one of my heroes that he signed versus a digital file that's just embedded in an email and just emailed to me, which one would I want? 100%, I want the physical print. Why? Why do we want that? Because it's superior, because it's tangible, it's physical, it's something that's in your hand. You can, I mean, you can smell it if you want, but you know what I mean? It has all the senses that makes us human that we appreciate, like a person that you can hug, right? Sure, you don't hug a print, but it's a physical thing that we can connect with, that you can keep in your wallet. If the electricity goes down, you, the, you, know, you still have the print in your hand. And so I, I say print your work, a, a long tangent there. But uh, anyways, I'm just gonna make sure 
promise a video on printing. Yeah, I should do a video on printing. Um, Donald Klein Media, when I was photojournalist, I always had fun trying to explain that we shoot RGB, but the magazine was CMYK. Yeah, I mean, I worked in the print industry, and I when I was at Kodak, we sold into the to the print industry. We sold uh, Kodak bought NCAD, which is a printing system. And same thing, yeah, I mean, the, the, the software to convert RGB to CMYK using the Pantone system was a headache, right? Because someone shows you a certain red, and you're like, I don't know what red that is. Like you're set, you're shooting it on a Nikon, uh, say film SLR, scanned it digitally, emailed to us. We're looking at it on our monitor and going like, we don't know what that red looks like. Like it's what our monitor tells us, but it's not necessarily what you saw. And how do you tell people, you got to send us a negative, right? We need the physical neg if we want accurate colors. But if even if it's a digital file, we need to know what color space they shot in. And that's why ideally you would use Adobe uh, RGB instead of just the standard uh, 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 Adobe because the color space is, has a wider uh, color gamut. And then when you print to CMYK, you got to make sure all the colors match or else the photographer gets pissed and says, this isn't what I saw. And it's like, but we, how, how do we know? We don't. We don't know that. And that's why it's always good to prove. In fact, I proof all my color prints, even if it's like an eight by 12 at Costco, I get four by sixes done first. And then when I look at it and I say, this looks great. So I know how the, how Costco sees the colors that I sent them. And if it's good, I'm like, perfect. And if it doesn't look right, then I go in and I tell them like, this isn't what I saw. And then I would explain to the printer what I want at Costco, but the guy knows who I am. And then he'll adjust the colors for me. And so one hour and two minutes. We've gone over time. Uh, thank you so much uh, uh, for joining. And I'm going to close this, but you can move some of your questions. If I miss some of your questions, um, please move it over to the comments down below, and I'll try to answer them as soon as possible. So thanks for joining, and we will talk to you soon, and happy shooting. Peace.